Welcome to Lead the Way with Anna Gauker. Your guide, Anna Gauker, is on a quest of her own to find effective ways of creating change and inclusion in our communities. You have come to the right place if you believe in truth, justice, and coffee. Thanks for joining us. Hello, this is Lead the Way, and I'm Anna Gauker. In this episode, I am bringing you a recent conversation I had with Representative Francesca Hong. She is the breakout political star who recently won an extremely competitive assembly seat and is now serving Wisconsin's 76th district. Along the way, she has made a huge impact in Madison with her innovative approach to owning a restaurant and the relationship it has with a community. Morris Ramen has become a place for good food and important conversations, as well as the headquarters for her other contributions to Madison. And we will get into all of it right now. Here's my conversation with Representative Francesca Hong. You know, I know that you have described yourself as a second generation Wisconsinite. Can you talk a bit about that and what your experience was like, you know, in Wisconsin before you got into politics? Yeah. So um, my parents immigrated here from South Korea in the late 80s, and um, I was born in Madison, Wisconsin. And we uh, we grew up kind of on the near west side. Um, I was in university housing with my parents for a while because my dad was pursuing his PhD in sociology and my mom um, ended up going back to school as well at UW um, uh, to study, uh, to get her teaching license in music education. Um, so I, my experience was, I guess, very, I mean, I had an, an immense amount of privilege um, and being surrounded by educators and going to a school that was um, divor- very diverse. Um, I think at the time, you know, um, I didn't realize really, it was just, it was, it, it felt very uh, normal to me that, you know, there were kids from over 50 different countries in my elementary school. And it was that diverse because there were a lot of, um, uh, a lot of families uh, who were here to study at the university. And, um, but then I think, you know, going to middle and high school, I, I started feeling um, what, I think a, a, what is common for a lot of Asian Americans, which is this this kind of tension and between um, understanding your Asian identity and while being in very close proximity to whiteness and trying to figure out, you know, where do I fit in? And, and for me, I didn't really think about it that much until I realized that, you know, everyone around me was even though I started out in a very diverse setting, um, as I was as I was growing up, um, I I really only had white friends. I really only um, participated in a lot of activities that were um, mostly with white people. And so I went into high school with with a lot of questions about racial identity, and um, was fortunate again to. Uh, have teachers at West High School, which is my alma mater, who kind of helped me navigate that, um, whether it was participating in this amazing theater program called Multico, um, where where we talked about race a lot and, and how it's a social construct and, and the disparities that existed um, 
that continue to exist um, amongst uh, different uh, races of people. And I think, you know, my Wisconsin experience is, is very much one of constantly questioning identity. Um, but I also, you know, so even before politics, I guess I kind of had a political mindset, but had no ambition to, to be a politician. Um, I, I left high school, went to college for a year, uh, ended up dropping out my second year and pursuing food. So um, there's, there's my Wisconsin experience. It continues to be one of just trying to find as many connections with different people as I can to kind of help build my own identity. When you think back to when you graduated from West High School, what do you remember about your vision for the future? Did you have like a big plan or were you kind of just taking it as you went along? Um, I think after high school, I didn't really have a vision. My biggest, I, I was still hell bent on figuring out who I was and not focusing so much on relationships. And I think as I started working in hospitalities is when I um, really started to prioritize, you know, uh, how to see people as people, how to connect with people, how to have better conversations. Um, I had struggled with mental health my last year of high school. Um, and I actually didn't walk at graduation because I was, um, I, I, I graduated um, but I didn't participate in a lot of school my last semester because I was um, uh, dealing with a lot of different mental health issues. And so, you know, going into college, I think I was trying to really figure out how to build identity again and then build relationships again because I felt so very isolated in, in um, those mental health experiences um, and struggles. So. I think my vision was really more so about um, exploring identity and uh, not so much like having a grand plan. How would you say, I mean, you said that you had to rebuild your identity. How would you describe the way your challenges during that phase of your life impacted your identity and why you had to start from scratch? Yeah, so I um, have always been very um, productivity task oriented, right? I was one of those overachievers in high school. Like I, I did the, the varsity soccer team and also participated in school plays and, you know, wanted to be in all of the clubs. And um, I think I completely burned myself out. And um, I didn't know, like, how to prioritize what was important to me anymore. And I think that's what contributed a lot to my mental health struggles. And so, when I talk about identity building, I think I was just trying to figure out how to, um, you know, figure out what was really meaningful to me again. And I think it's what drew me to hospitality. It's what made me um, kind of fall in love with cooking is that it, it I didn't have to overanalyze, overanalyze or think too much when I was cooking and when I was working with my hands and in the middle of service and balancing, you know, a very high stress situation, because I think um, part of my uh, being, um, uh, so, so I suffer from manic depression and, and have been diagnosed before, prior uh, as being bipolar. And I think, you know, 
when I'm cooking and, and when I'm in a restaurant setting, um, there's, there's, a, there's a controlled chaos that I really identify with. And I think that helps me build my own identity in knowing that I am someone that uh, does very well in high stress situations, but, but also um, needs the kind of controlled uh, environment of, a, of, a, of a, a line on in the kitchen right and um, and so my mental health struggles um, I think are a big part of my identity and um, they help me build it, it actually I see those struggles as a way for me to get to know myself better which ultimately helps me helps others get to know me and I think that it's um, those experiences as in the moment, as difficult as they are, when um, they, they really do help shape and, and make your relationship stronger because you have a better sense of who you are. And, and I think a better sense you have of yourself, um, the better you can be for someone else. Definitely. What was your first job in the food service? industry? So I was a hostess at a, a small kind of Korean fusion restaurant on the west side. Uh, the restaurant was called Mystic Grill. And I went from hostess and then I started, um, I worked as a server there. And then my first cooking job was at um, La Brioche and, and it's still there on University Avenue. Um, and uh, I worked salads there and uh, I was the expo as well for brunch and um, yeah, that was uh, uh, a job that I, I, I learned so much from and, and some of the relationships with people I, I built there, I, I still have to this day. You mentioned that you really like the controlled chaos of the restaurant. What other qualities do you think helped you excel in that environment? I think the restaurant industry, it's, it's kind of this beautiful space because you have so many different personalities and character and characteristics of folks um, in, in, one, in one place kind of with the goal of, of nourishing, feeding and making others happy. And I think that you know, from the outside, it can sound really chaotic, but from the inside, it can, it's also, you know, it's, it's very harmonious and controlled. And, and I think some people view restaurant service as, you know, a, a sh even like they'll compare it to like a, a, a production, right? A, a show. And um, I think there's a, an element of control to every service. Um, in terms of how much you have to prep and how much you have to prep and, and how much uh, you know making sure that you're constantly communicating and um, but the chaos comes from the fact that we can control the customers and those behaviors those are always the variables right that the customers are the variables you don't know what they might need as much as you try to prep for it um, yeah. and you don't what they want and I think being able to adapt and be flexible and and know that you work together as a team to make um, uh, other folks around you and and your customers happy is our our um, our qualities that are important to every job um, we just happen to really excel at it in the hospitality industry or the restaurants I think um, that do well have systems in place where, where that works well. Did you learn any specific tips on how to interact with the public through those first jobs? Yes. Um, I, I think, you know, working as a server, um, you, there's, you, you come to see kind of, I don't want it to sound like it's, it's, it's not judging folk. You 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 embrace first impressions, um, and and um, you you kind of get to know folks quickly. Um, in, in that time, you might be taking an order. Um, I, I think 
I learned the most about um, how really everyone just wants to be treated as um, with respect. And I learned a lot about, you know, service and making others happy um, comes with great emotional toll. And there's a lot of emotional labor that gets expended in the hospitality industry, but that can be said for a lot of different jobs. I think in the hospitality, what makes it unique is that um, you are, uh, you're not always seeing the, you're not always feeling the, um, the value of, of that emotional work. It, it's not always, it doesn't always come to you in, in dollars or a paycheck, I think, um, but it builds a resiliency and it builds an understanding for, uh, for people to, you know, treat others kinder because they've been treated badly in that situation. And if a customer is rude to a server or something, I think you, you build kind of that resiliency of and a patience uh, to that behavior. And um, it, it's not it's not so much like just taking it if, if someone treats you badly and leaves you a bad tip or, or is demanding of you. I think it's more so um, you develop a, um, a, a, an empathy um, that you know that, that that person might be having a bad day and it wasn't my fault and um, I'm not always a reason for someone else's bad behavior or rude behavior. Um, I, I think interactions that happen in third spaces like restaurants, um, you learn a lot just about uh, building your own resiliency and, and really understanding how you want to treat others the way you want to be treated. Can you tell us a bit about the restaurant that you opened Morris Ramen and how this influenced your view on the difficulties for working class people? Yeah, so we opened Morris Ramen back in 2016. Um, we're celebrating our fifth year this year. Um, we opened the space knowing that we wanted it to be um, a community space. We wanted it to be, um, you know, everything that bad that happened to us in restaurants, we wanted to make sure it didn't happen to our team and that our customers would never feel like, um, our customers would feel like our staff were friends and family. And, and we wanted to create a space where folks could um, have meetings and, and foster new ideas. And, and, um, or, and regardless if you were dining alone or dining with a big group or celebrating a special event that we would create a space that would be welcoming of all of those different things. Um, and so I think having my son the same year we opened the restaurant, I, I ended up really um, living that, that building family dynamics in a restaurant space uh, more than I realized. And um, I think when I first started, we, we also opened in 2016 um, after the election of, of 45. And um, I knew that uh, at, at that moment, we, we had a responsibility to be a space that people felt safe to. Because I, I knew having someone like that in office permeated a, a fear that could be very um, uh, and, and has shown to be very consequential. And so, you know, I wanted, and I knew that we could come back kind of the, the, um, the, the fear that people were feeling with him in office by 
being a place that fostered important and difficult conversations surrounding um, race and uh, disparities um, and inequities in our society. So having a fundraiser for Planned Parenthood was one of the first things we did. Um, one of our team members was um, uh, transitioning and, and we had a big we had a conversation about the importance of pronouns and um, we uh, had, uh, you know, there were a couple cases of um, sexual harassment that we were hearing about happening in other restaurants. And so we, through team meetings and um, community events, we realized that it, we needed to be a space that lived up to being a community space by holding um, active conversations about how to address some of these issues. Um, how do we uh, elevate uh, other businesses or uh, micro businesses, businesses owned by people of color? Can we be a pop-up space for them? Um, and, and then through Culinary Ladies Collective, how do we create more spaces where uh, women feel welcome in our industry as that's disproportionately um, male dominated? So we, the, the restaurant as important as it was to nourish people with food, um, we really started, we recognized that we needed to nourish um, people in, through and, and their souls in other ways too. And I think it, it helped in the success of our business um, pre-COVID uh, that we were, that we didn't always just see ourselves at the restaurant. We wanted the restaurant um, to be uh, 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 a community space and, um, and that that's how we would kind of address the rising inequities and disparities that were coming to light in, in our city. I definitely want to come back to the Culinary Ladies Collective, but you were talking about really having a safe space for your staff and the people in your restaurant and wanting them to not experience some of the negative things that you've seen or experienced in your previous uh, jobs at restaurants, you know, how can you have confidence to keep things like sexual harassment out of the environment when it can just feel like, you know, there's things you can't always control? I think can have all of the safety plans in place, you know, but there are always going to be situations that we feel, we want to avoid having situations that we feel unprepared for. And to be proactive in that, um, I think it's important that everyone you work with um, you know that they have your back, both inside the workspace and outside. And treating the staff um, and establishing within the team the sense that we are family and we're gonna hold ourselves accountable to one another. I, I think that in itself does create um, a, a sense of, of safety because you feel like you belong there. Um, kind of going back to when I think about identity building, especially um, as an Asian American, it, it to find spaces where you belong, I think, um, is, is a constant struggle. And um, for me, creating a safer space is a space that everyone feels like they belong. And in the restaurant, you know, it was important to, um, you know, make sure that we could have difficult conversations that everyone felt open and could trust um, my partner and I to have 
difficult conversations if there were to be a case where they felt unsafe that they could come and tell us why and, and they knew that we would try to address it right away. Um, but we, we had to build that trust first. And I think in order to build that trust, you know, we, we prove that through our work ethic. We, we constantly try to show that by um, uh, being supportive of our employees, both inside and outside of the, the workplace. And again, uh, being open about our own vulnerabilities and I think constantly having, um, constantly communicating, you know, we, we would hold monthly team meetings and um, have different uh, uh, spaces where people, people could post c comments or anyone could ask for a team meeting if they needed to bring something to the team. Um, if there was an incident, uh, uh, you know, we, we wanted to make sure everyone felt like their voice was heard, um, that they could um, have difficult, difficult conversations with, with the group and that, um, you know, giving people that, that, that agency to, um, uh, to, um, voice their, their concerns and their opinions at work. Um, that was important. And I think that's a, a key part of, you know, building an, in an environment where people feel like they belong and ultimately feel safe. Now, please tell me more about what is the Culinary Ladies Collective? Where did the idea come from? And how did you make it a reality? Yes, yeah, so uh, the Culinary Ladies Collective, um, key founders were uh, Leila Burrow came and Tammy Lax, and you know, we it started with uh, a conversation, a, like a, a group of women coming together to tell their stories about their experience in the restaurant industry. And we all had different ones. Not everyone experienced misogyny, not everyone experienced sexual harassment. Um, some folks did, and, and others had you know, never uh, experienced um, uh, um, any sort of uh, discrimination before. But having that initial meeting where we just said, hey, we know each other as women in the industry, let's kind of come together and figure out how we can empower one another. Um, it, yeah, it started with coffee and snacks and really the power of storytelling, I think is what compelled us to continue to make spaces where we could share stories. And we knew that this type of networking was, was how we were going to empower one another. And so, you know, Layla was really the soul of that. Layla really wanted to make sure that, that um, you know, women who weren't discriminated against saw why the women who were were being discriminated against. What were the conditions and the environments that they were working in, whether it be a, a difficult male chef or um, just feeling like you have to kind of prove yourself and be quiet in order to advance in the hierarchy of, of you know, the different uh, uh, levels of leadership that are in a kitchen. Um, she, she, she was really the soul of, of empowering women and I helped with like the organizing part of it, right? Uh, establishing a nonprofit and, and um, kind of figuring out how we would, how we would empower each other outside of the storytelling and the networking. And I think what it was, was building this mission statement around, you know, using our shared collective resources and talents we want to not only empower ourselves, but other women in the community. And then that evolved to, it's not just women, you know, it, it needs to be our non-binary allies and, and femmes and um, queer folks and really anyone who feels like they are underrepresented or discriminated against in the industry. We wanna create a space where you can freely talk about um, those issues, but also, empower one another entrepreneurially um, by kind of 
you know, having a space where folks with more experience like Tammy, who's owned a restaurant for 20 years, can talk to uh, folks who are thinking about, you know, moving what was, you know, baking cakes for folks or uh, a, a small business that maybe they were thinking of, of running from uh, a home or a, a, a mobile uh, pop-up space into a retail space or a storefront. Um, how can we collectively share resources to empower one another? And I think that's that's really what's at the, the core of Culinary Ladies Collective is, is um, again, creating these spaces where women can empower one another and, you know, through networking, through shared talents, through shared resources. And, you know, that's, that's how we participated or created fundraisers like the Cookie Grab. Um, you know, being able to raise $25,000 for Planned Parenthood by, by baking cookies and, and selling them was amazing. And it, it gave everyone um, a, a sense of belonging to uh, an organization that, that had this purpose and, and um, you know, outside of the grind of the restaurant industry, because it's a grind and it's a lot. It, sometimes there's room for a ton of creativity and other days you're cleaning up the grease trap. But, but to have a space like Culinary Ladies Collective where you feel like, you know, if you don't always have the freedom, because again, I think the fact that Morris is a collective, a community space, we, we are privileged in that. Um, not everyone can, can be that. And, and to have CLC as a space um, to be able to co uh, contribute to your community, um, even if you're you're in the weeds of operating your business, um, I, I think that was really meaningful for folks, and so um, it, it it continues to be a, a place where um, even I can go and 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 find inspiration and um, just be in awe of the work that women in our industry are doing. Can you tell me more about how Culinary Ladies Collective? is empowering people who are marginalized? Is it through fundraisers? Is it through mentorship? How is it bringing this change? Yeah, so I think as a, as a networking space, you know, we, it, it people were able to kind of identify different problems in the in the forums. Um, but we're, I think our outside of um, raising money for organizations um, like, uh, and fundraising for organizations like Planned Parenthood and this year Harambe Village, um, and, and uplifting these organizations and crediting them for, for the work that they have done is, is one way that um, the, uh, CLC as a group is is kind of bringing to light the disparities in our community. Harambe Village does amazing work in supporting new families and really um, addressing the disparities in uh, 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 Black uh, infant mortality rates. Um, and, you know, we know that plan Parenthood also uh, has has done a lot of work and and um, and continues to do work in uh, uh, bringing making uh, health bringing healthcare to uh, women who do not always have access to healthcare um, and reproductive healthcare. Um, we also provide entrepreneurial support through um, events like Festival. Uh, festival last year was our, our inaugural year and it was um, it's uh, it's a food and beverage um, festival that celebrates women in the industry and we celebrate them by making sure that there are no barriers uh, for them to uh, promote their business and so there is no um, uh, there's no uh, uh, vendor fee for them to participate and we um, make sure that the access to businesses that are owned by uh, people of color are prioritized um, and we uh, work with uh, organizations like Center Hispano and um, we see 
sponsorship support from uh, larger uh, corporate donors and kind of help, uh, we make sure to help uh, these entrepreneurs um, not only make, you know, network with, with other uh, uh, women and uh, POC entrepreneurs, but um, uh, can build their customer base through this festival. So primarily fundraising, uh, networking spaces, and then really seeing where we can be helpful um, uh, in terms of providing uh, resources uh, for folks who may be starting out businesses. When did you get CLC off the ground? Uh, 2016. Okay, and then in the summer of 2020, you started Click It Forward. Can you tell me a little bit about that? Yeah, so Cook It Forward was initially a response to um, growing food insecurity in our community due to COVID-19, in addition to um, the growing fear and uh, financial hit that our uh, independent restaurants in um, Madison faced. So when we first, uh, the Morris Ramen, when we first received our PPP loan, we decided to reopen as a community kitchen um, and, and use some of those funds to hire back all of our employees because we shut down um, initially. Uh, we hired back, uh, we offered everyone our, our, on our staff their jobs back and, and those who came back to work with us, um, we said, all right, we are now pivoting from being a ramen shop to uh, we're gonna package meals for as many people as we can because our, uh, our, our community really needs us. And I think that um, we have the resources here between the labor and the, the knowledge of food prep and, and our connection to our farmers uh, to be able to create these meals. My uh, neighbors across the street at Lucille and Merchant, uh, Josh Berkson and Patrick Sweeney, then approached me with the idea of expanding Morris Community Kitchen to um, uh, initiative where restaurants would be paid to uh, make meals, package meals, and then deliver them to uh, uh, under-resourced uh, communities that um, needed these meals. So we decided, you know, after that I said, okay, that sounds great. Where are we going to find the money to do this? And and also, I don't want there to be a, a savior complex to this, right? Like these are bringing together the profit, for profit, small business community, the nonprofit, and then possibly the public sector as well. It's it's a delicate balance of understanding relationships and really crediting work that has been done in these sectors separately and figuring out how to collaborate. Um, so someone who was perfect to help us do that was Alnisa Allgood from Collab for Good. And Alnisa really helped us develop the uh, equity mission of Cook It Forward. That bringing these meals into uh, communities of color was about building relationships with the leaders of grassroots organizations like Freedom Inc., Urban Triage, um, uh, uh, EOTO, Culturally Rooted, and, and taking the lead from the Black women who served at the helms of these organizations to, to um, you know, supporting their needs if, uh, and understanding that they know the needs of their communities best. Um, and that the equity portion of this would be, we can't just deliver food to one location and expect everyone to be able to access it. Uh, we need to make sure that these meals are getting into the hands of folks. And so that meant, you know, last mile delivery, which is, um, you know, the, the folks who are gonna take the meals from a central distribution site and, and bring them to the doorstep. Um, and, and that those folks should be paid, that there should be a job creation portion of this as well. So once we had those pieces together, um, we fundraised and uh, we were able to launch Cook It Forward as an initiative to really uplift um, those three sec those different sectors, the, the restaurants who would be given, you know, $10 a meal and more importantly, um, that creating these meals was going to create consistent income for their business, paying last mile delivery drivers and creating those jobs 
and then ultimately getting food for folks who weren't just in, you know, under-resourced communities, but were folks who were, um, you know, having uh, mental health issues or folks who are, um, you know, may not just always have the means to uh, create, um, uh, you know, because they're they're uh, recovering from uh, medical surgeries or things like that, um, may not always have the means for foods. So, Cook It Forward, um, to this day now has has raised over uh, two hundred sixty thousand dollars in funds that have been redistributed out to the community in the forms of of meals and helping our small businesses and paying out last mile delivery drivers and and we're learning more and more about you know how restaurants can be a part of strengthening community food systems how you know the work that's being done um in in uh, uh food access um it has to be uh we have to um, be very thoughtful and mindful of folks who are doing this work um, and that getting food to folks, you know, it, it may, it's not just about having a distribution center where people can go to um, uh, pick up food or receive food that we need to be thinking about um, the folks who through uh, no uh, fault of their own may not be able to access some of these distribution sites. So Cook It Forward, it's 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 a great initiative that is still growing and learning and, and figuring out um, what our our role can be to help our community um, tackle food insecurity um, while uplifting businesses um, that have been hit really hard through COVID. What a huge accomplishment. And as everyone knows, I mean, this was all taking place during a period of such chaos. And I think everyone in the country at that point was really struggling to figure out day to day what is happening and how are we as individuals going to operate in this environment and what's the next Thing to come around the corner. Meanwhile, you are one player in a very complex operation coming together and trying to solve a big problem. You know, through your memory of that time, how can you explain how it was all able to come together in a strategic way where people are listening to each other and making rational decisions and really joining forces for the greater good. How did you pull it off? I think part of it was just this Madison this community looking out for me and folks pointing me into direct, like one person told me to talk to this person and, and having, um, you know, met so many different people through the restaurant, you know, we, we, the beauty of restaurants in the hospitality industry is I think it really is, um, at least ours, we wanted it to be a space where lots of different people from different backgrounds could, could come and enjoy a bowl, bowl of soup and noodles. And, and what that did was create a, a network of folks for me who um, helped me find those who were already doing that work and already in, in work that um, kind of the chaos and, and um, seeing struggle, um, being in that type of work is very taxing. And I think um, it was important for me to, to find those folks. And um, when I did find those folks like Alnisa who then had all these amazing resources um, in, in terms of knowing other women who were, who were leading organizations. I think it was 
I think I pulled it off because I was very fortunate to be connected with people who knew what they were doing a lot of times better than what I was doing. And I had the humility to recognize, you know, um, when I had a lane and when um, others and, and when to stay in that lane and then when to come out of it. Um, it, it to be specific, I think it's, it's more so um, I I think folks saw that um, I my intentions were always to help folks, but sometimes just that can give you tunnel vision. And I was fortunate to have met people who um, didn't want that to deter me from doing really good. So they they helped and and um, they helped me build other relationships. Like, okay, actually, I'm going to backtrack there. I think one of the most difficult parts about Cook It Forward was convincing um, people who are, are coming from a very business or small business or entrepreneurial background um, in, in connecting them with community organizing work and, and how, uh, how these different styles of operations could still work together. And I think my job, I realized that in order to make Cook It Forward happen, I needed to be the person that um, could help kind of finesse and um, be a bridge to the different experiences between, you know, white male privilege and um, some like a person like Elnisa who's black experience had, you know, really given her this perspective that was sometimes I think difficult for um, my white male founders to understand. I think there's a difference from of just listening and then kind of understanding and bringing everyone into this space through Cook It Forward I think we pulled it off because th there was an honesty there and a discomfort and we had uncomfortable conversations where um, people grew from it. And I think Cook It Forward's success is because, you know, we had difficult conversations about, um, you know, how do we build this vision for an organization about serving with tackling food insecurity and still helping our businesses and getting folks to be on board with this. We have to be authentic to the realities of what's happening in our city. And I think without having and, and building that narrative and building that vision um, can't just be from one experience. And so I don't think it's so much like how I pulled it off as much as it is me trying to um, have everyone's, everyone recognize each other's strengths and experiences and see that our diversity and these strengths and experiences was what was gonna make our initiative successful. I'm not sure I am. <laughs> Yeah, you did. Thank you. And then in November of 2020, you were elected to the Wisconsin Assembly. And for anyone who doesn't know, it was a very competitive race. How many of you were in the race at one time? Uh, it was, it was a seven-way primary. Seven-way, yeah, exactly. And Historically, the district that you're now representing in the Wisconsin 
assembly is a progressive stronghold. It's a very big deal that you made it all the way through. And it's so exciting. How has your experience been in this beginning part of the new chapter? My experience has been tumultuous, overwhelming, fascinating, and and I'm still feeling incredibly grateful for this opportunity, even though at times I am um, all of those things at once. (laughs) What was the biggest challenge you encountered during the campaign? The biggest challenge was battling my own imposter syndrome. And the next challenge was worrying that talking about racial inequities during a time of not so much reckoning where it was, it was, it should have it, discussing the racial inequities and disparities and the inequalities in our society should have been a driving factor in our policies for a very long time. But our primary, the summer, everything that happened with um, uh, George Floyd and Jacob Blake's shooting Um, Brianna Taylor, I think I didn't always know if being a non, I I was constantly questioning if if being a non-Black person, if if I was the right person to represent all of the trauma and the suffering that a lot of our constituents um, were trying to convey to their leaders. And what I realized was that I would never want and could never speak for anyone because it's their stories and their narratives and it's not, certainly not a representative's job and it's certainly not a, a, a non-Black person of color's job to co-opt those stories. Um, so the challenge was how do I establish relationships with communities of color and convince people that my role would be to amplify their needs, their goals, their visions, and help them thrive. Um, And not be the one to tell their stories, but give them the spaces to do it. Um, And I think it was always a challenge to um, to center that message and not one of, uh, you know, trying to center my own racial identity in the conversation. Well, I really appreciate your time. I'll just end with one question. How are you managing your time to juggle all of these different roles? What's the secret? The secret is a good leader surrounds themselves with people who oftentimes do the job better than you and to see strength in people and be a leader that can help amplify those strengths. I am fortunate to be surrounded by people who um, not only believe in in my success, but believe in that my success is, is key to their success and that constantly thinking about collaboration and teamwork and not making it about myself, I think I'm able to continue in different roles. Um, Basically, I have amazing people who step up and uh, tell me when to step down. And I listen to them when they tell me I got to step down or step aside. So I think it's really about prioritizing um, cooperation and collaboration. Francesca, thank you so much.
Thanks so much for having me. It was truly uh, an honor to be in this space and uh, really appreciate being able to speak with you. That was Representative Francesca Hong. She's so amazing. Thanks so much to her and her team for making that conversation happen. Be sure to check out Cook It Forward at cookitforwardmadison.com. All episodes of Lead the Way can be found on Spotify, Google Podcasts, Stitcher, TuneIn, YouTube, and make sure to rate and review when you subscribe on Apple Podcasts. Special thanks to Buzz Kemper for his voiceover artistry in the opening. This episode was brought to you by the time and talent of Tyler Willenbrink, Annie Petras, Katie Simak, and Jeremy Van Mill. I'm Anna Galker. Until next time.